It seems that Ravi Zacharias, one of the most popular Christian apologists of all time, was also a sexual predator. And you're about to understand why. According to the evidence that's come out in recent months, Ravi Zacharias was living two lives. In one life, he was an internationally acclaimed author and speaker, loved by millions, praised even by his enemies for his eloquence. In the other life, he was a manipulative pervert. Now, until last month, I wasn't planning to say much about the Ravi Zacharias scandal, not because it's not important, but because there was nothing important for me to add to the discussion. He died in May. I know that there's this popular trend, especially on social media, where whenever someone does something wrong, everyone has to jump in to show that they're on the correct side of every issue. So we're all supposed to write a post or make a video saying, I condemn that. And if we don't proclaim our condemnation, people say, oh, so-and-so didn't condemn such and such. Maybe he approves of it. Ridiculous trend. I don't know any Christian apologist who doesn't condemn sexual misconduct, so I don't see much of a point in virtue signaling. Obviously, the truth needs to come out, but investigators have been taking care of that, and there are some people who were close to Ravi and who feel betrayed by him and are making sure that the truth comes out. I've never met Ravi or spoken to Ravi, so again, it didn't seem like there was anything for me to add. We can always learn valuable lessons from scandals, but John McRae and Elisa Childers and others have already been drawing out the lessons, not much for D. Wood to say. But early last month, I was asked to sign a statement from Christian apologists and philosophers urging Ravi Zacharias International Ministries to make all their findings public, to hold people who were involved in any sort of cover-up accountable, and to make restitution to any victims. At first, I wasn't interested in signing, but as I thought more about this scandal, I realized that there is, embedded in this mess, one of the most important lessons that Christians can possibly learn right now, something that should be discussed regularly in churches, but just isn't. Indeed, even though Ravi shared thousands of messages over the years, his most important message for the world may be this final message that he left us with. It's a message about how we end up living double lives and how we end up with two-faced heroes. I am the man to explain this problem because I've been living a double life since I was five years old. If we can get our minds around this now as a result of the Ravi Zacharias scandal, and if we can take some healthy steps to avoid this problem in the future, it would be a massive course correction for the church. Ravi Zacharias being exposed would turn out to be something positive rather than negative. If you watch this video till the end, please let me know whether I'm right about Christians and even non-Christians really, really needing to hear this. Before we start, let me say a few things about the situation. First, if you're one of the people who don't believe that the allegations against Ravi are true, if you think that Women who've never met each other are making up some remarkably similar stories about Ravi's behavior. If you think that photos and messages were planted on the phones that investigators examined, it's theoretically possible that there's some massive conspiracy to tarnish his legacy, but the evidence definitely doesn't seem to be pointing in that direction. The independent legal firm that was hired to investigate claims of inappropriate behavior at some spas concluded their report with this. Our investigation was limited to Mr. Zacharias's sexual misconduct, and even as to that issue, it was not exhaustive. We acknowledge that we have not spoken to all individuals who may have relevant information to provide. We strived to balance the need for completeness with the need for expediency, and we are confident that we uncovered sufficient evidence to conclude that Mr. Zacharias engaged in sexual misconduct. The RZIM Board of Directors admits that there was serious sexual misconduct, the board said in a statement. To be victimized by unwanted sexual contact, advances, and behavior is horrendous. It is diametrically opposed to everything we believe about the value and dignity of every single person. 
We believe not only the women who made their allegations public, but also additional women who had not previously made public allegations against Robbie, but whose identities and stories were uncovered during the investigation. Tragically, witnesses described encounters, including sexting, unwanted touching, spiritual abuse, and rape. We are devastated by what the investigation has shown and are filled with sorrow for the women who were hurt by this terrible abuse. Carson Whitenauer, who worked for RZIM for years, said this, The realization that Ravi Zacharias was not the greatest apologist of his generation, but rather one of its greatest frauds, has felt like a catastrophic betrayal. In dealing with this news, I have felt a sickening combination of revulsion and grief. So, if you think that Ravi just didn't do any of this, not looking good for you. Second, whenever someone brings up the Ravi Zacharias scandal, some of you freak out and you say, what? You can't talk about a man who's not here to defend himself. Now, it's normally a good idea to give people an opportunity to defend themselves against accusations, but are you seriously taking this as an absolute? If I die tomorrow and police find a dozen bodies buried in the crawl space under my house and an investigation shows that they were all murdered by me, are you seriously claiming that everyone should keep their mouths shut about it because I already died and wouldn't be there to defend myself? If that's the case, the goal of every Christian leader who does horrible things should be to cover them up until he dies, because once he dies, his fans will keep people quiet. There's a word for those of you who always want to cover up things for your leaders. You're called enablers. My view is that we generally shouldn't be going around trying to expose people's faults. If a Christian leader struggles with some issues behind the scenes, we don't need to use his faults to ruin his reputation, especially after he dies. But if there are victims of what that Christian leader has done, if there are people who are still suffering the consequences of what that Christian leader has done, even after he dies, then he may need to be exposed, depending on what's in the best interest of the victims and the church and the world. Keep in mind, Ravi had an opportunity to respond to some of the accusations against him. He responded by lying and blaming the victims. If you heard that a husband and wife targeted him in order to extort money from him, that's not what happened. Even RZIM now admits that the woman was the victim. She was groomed and manipulated into a cyber relationship with Ravi, a relationship that he wanted to become physical. He paid the couple to sign a non-disclosure agreement so that they couldn't talk about what happened. And as soon as they signed the non-disclosure agreement, he released a statement portraying the couple as extortionists and himself as the victim. So Ravi has managed to continue victimizing that woman post-mortem because many people still think that she set out to blackmail him. We can't fix that if we're not allowed to talk about it. Apart from that, there are lots of other victims. Let's read about one of Ravi's spa victims from the report of the investigators, which I'll link to in the description box in case you want to read all of it. This witness told us that their relationship began as a normal massage therapist client relationship, and she came to think of him as a father figure. He elicited information about her faith and her financial situation. She reported that after he arranged for the ministry to provide her with financial support, he required sex from her. According to this witness, Mr. Zacharias used religious expressions to gain compliance as she was raised to be a person of faith. She reported that he made her pray with him to thank God for the opportunity they both received. She said he called her his reward for living a life of service to God, and he referenced the godly men in the Bible with more than one wife. She said he warned her not ever to speak out against him or she would be responsible for the millions of souls whose salvation would be lost if his reputation was damaged. That sounds like psychological and spiritual and sexual abuse. Should the church be in the business of hushing this up to protect reputations? 
some of the same Christians who gladly condemned the Catholic Church for how it handled the abuse scandals are now insisting that Ravi's reputation is so important that we need to throw his victims under the bus. Look, Ravi had a chance to come clean, and he chose to lie and to blame the victims in order to protect his reputation. Are you seriously claiming that we all need to do the same for him? If there's still any doubt about whether we should be discussing this, Ravi's ministry said in their most recent statement, we want to help the victims of Ravi's abuse, and we want to thoroughly understand what has taken place in our organization so that we can do everything we can to make sure nothing like this happens again. Those are the correct goals here. Help the victims and thoroughly understand what happened so that steps can be taken to make sure it doesn't happen again. Hard to do either one of those if we're not allowed to talk about what happened. Third, I'm going to assume that Ravi was a deeply flawed Christian and not a complete fraud. I've read the entire report from the investigators. If you read it, you'll start wondering, was this man a complete fraud? Did he believe what he was saying in his lectures and books? Again, I've never met Ravi, but based on what's available to me right now, he seems like a Christian who took lots of small steps deeper and deeper into sin over a period of several decades until he was living two completely different lives. If you've seen the show Breaking Bad, that was the theme of the show. Walter White went from being a high school chemistry teacher to being a meth kingpin and a murderer. He wasn't a terrible, violent person by nature. He just kept making decisions that turned him into a terrible, violent person. Vince Gilligan, the show's creator and head writer, wanted Walter White to be an example of how the small decisions we make every day can slowly turn us into monsters. How does this happen to a Christian? We'll get to that in a few minutes. Fourth, are you surprised that respected leaders can be doing horrible things behind the scenes? If so, I have no idea where you've been for all of human history. Even if you just stick with people in the Bible, what do you find? The Bible is a history of one massive moral failure after another, with only one exception. Jesus is the exception. All of the other major figures in the Bible screw up royally. King David was called a man after God's own heart. He defeated Goliath when he was too young to wear armor. He conquered Jerusalem. He established the kingdom. All he wanted to do then was build a temple for God. God promised to give him an everlasting kingdom. Then David committed adultery with Bathsheba and had one of his most faithful soldiers killed to try to cover up the affair. So according to the Bible, a man after God's own heart can become an epic moral failure. Do you really think your favorite scholar or pastor or apologist is immune to this? By the way, this point should help answer those of you who think that the goal of Christians should be to cover up the sins of popular leaders. The biblical perspective seems to be that some sins need to be exposed so that lessons can be learned. Fifth, more details are going to come out about Ravi. This wasn't a moral slip-up. This was long-term abusive behavior. How long had it been going on? We don't know yet. But if multiple victims have already come forward, and more were found during the investigation, and the investigation was pretty limited, there are going to be more victims who are going to come forward in the future, and the worst details may be yet to come. Sixth, if you're worried about the damage this will do to Christian apologetics, stop worrying. The good thing about arguments and evidence is that they don't depend on the character of the person presenting them. You might be more inclined to listen to someone you respect and less inclined to listen to someone you don't respect, but at the end of the day, a good argument is a good argument, even if the person who's presenting it is a terrible person. And a bad argument is a bad argument, even if the person who's presenting it is your favorite person in the world. If I walk up to you and tell you that two plus two is four, and I punch you in your mouth, that shouldn't make you doubt that two plus two is four. If I walk up to you and tell you that two plus two is five, and I buy you a new car, that shouldn't make you start thinking that two plus two is five. 
If William Lane Craig axe murders a busload of orphans tomorrow, that doesn't affect whether the Kalam cosmological argument is a good argument or a bad argument. So the only way the moral failures of a person would make you doubt that person's arguments and evidence is if your belief was based on the person, not on the arguments or evidence. And if your belief is based on your liking some apologist, get used to disappointment. So at most, the Ravi Zacharias scandal should terrify you with this thought. Oh my goodness, people I admire and respect, people who are my heroes, might be dirtbags behind the scenes. A man who's convinced millions of people to think more carefully about Christianity also convinced women working at a spa to give him more than just a massage. A man who convinced me to donate to his ministry used donations to fund his affairs. How can I trust my heroes when I may not know what they're really like? These are not insignificant concerns. This is the problem of the two-faced hero. Believe it or not, both the world in general and the church in particular are set up to create two-faced heroes. Let's talk about how we get a two-faced hero, and then we'll see what we can do to change the system. Years ago, when I was still in prison, I read an article that mentioned some adulterous affairs that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was involved in. And that was puzzling to me. We're talking about someone that many of us would regard as one of the greatest leaders of all time, one of the greatest role models of all time. How could someone like that be an adulterer behind the scenes? How can you be the sort of person who can face police smacking you with batons, spraying you with fire hoses, sicking dogs on you, throwing you in jail, and you never back down, you never flinch? But then, when you see an attractive young woman, you just can't resist. How does that work? Well, a few years ago, I studied willpower, and it turns out that there's a connection between standing strong in one area and being weak in another area. Your willpower is like fuel in a tank. You have one tank of willpower, and you can use it on different things. Willpower is like a muscle in that you can strengthen it so that it's like you have a bigger tank of willpower. But you draw on that same tank of willpower whenever you're doing anything that requires it. If you're forcing yourself to do some math homework that you really don't want to do, you're drawing from the same tank of willpower you'd be using if you were trying to quit smoking. Now, here's the important part. If you face some stressful situations, situations that require a ton of willpower, you can suddenly be extremely weak at resisting some totally unrelated temptation that you would have been able to resist if you hadn't depleted your supply of willpower. Think about how much willpower Martin Luther King was using on a daily basis. He was under a death sentence from a lot of people. There were plenty of people who wanted to beat and kill him. Who could he call about this? The police. There were plenty of police officers who wanted to beat and kill him. The FBI. The FBI was stalking and threatening him. There were even tons of Christian leaders who were stabbing him in the back. There were Christian leaders who agreed with him about the problem and agreed with him on the goal, but were convinced that his methods of dealing with the problem and reaching the goal were completely wrong. So they publicly condemned him. That was the general situation all day, every day. And that was in addition to the more particular showdowns in Birmingham and Selma and so on. So what happens here? Your willpower tank is already running pretty low from the everyday stress. You're in a constant state of anxiety. Then your tank runs dry because of some epic confrontation. You stand your ground, but it takes every last drop of strength you have. Then, just when your ability to resist temptation is at its lowest point, and just when all the cameras and crowds go away because the march is over, leaving you with no accountability, whatever your weakness happens to be, whether it's drugs or alcohol or violence or food or, in this case, women, it suddenly shows up like clockwork. Doesn't mean that you're going to give in to the temptation, but if you're going to give in to the temptation, this is probably when it's going to happen. We see people run out of willpower 
in the Bible. Think about Elijah. He has his epic showdown with hundreds of false prophets. He crushes them. It was a total victory, complete with a miraculous sign from the Almighty. What did Elijah do after that total victory? He ran into the desert and started begging God to kill him. He said, God, I can't keep doing this. Please just kill me. And God had to miraculously sustain him because once the adrenaline wore off and his willpower was gone, Elijah didn't want to fight anymore. You can't keep driving at 120 miles an hour. You're going to crash. What does this have to do with Ravi? Well, Ravi wasn't facing kings and queens who were trying to kill him or police spraying him with fire hoses, but he was known for spending hundreds of days per year away from home traveling. Sometimes he would fly into an area and have to speak three or four times that day. When he was done for the day, he would go to sleep at the hotel, wake up early, fly out early, and do the same thing somewhere else. Seems like doing that day after day, year after year, could take its toll on certain people. They might be driven to travel and spread their message, but they might also get lonely at night. I have no idea how long Ravi kept this up without crossing the sexual immorality line, but at some point he crossed it. Maybe he didn't go looking to cross it, he could have just ended up in the wrong massage parlor after a really bad day. But somehow, at some point, he crossed a line. That's how it starts. Now, as a Christian, what are you supposed to do if you fall into some sort of sin? You're supposed to repent, ask God for forgiveness, and take precautions to make sure you don't keep doing it. Depending on what it is, it could be something you have to confess to other people, your wife or husband, some Christian friends, maybe even the church. Again, it depends on who's involved, who's been affected, and what precautions are going to be needed. But here's where an additional problem arises for people like Ravi. If you're a rock star Christian with family and friends and fans who adore you and look to you as a model Christian, what do you do when you fall into sin? You don't want to tell your family or your friends because they all look up to you. You certainly don't want to tell your fans because that might hurt their faith and hurt your ministry. So you keep it a secret and thus begins the double life of the Christian leader. I can't tell other people about this. I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to damage my work. So I'll just keep this between me and God. Maybe that works out for some people, but maybe that person eventually has another bad day and does the same thing. Once again, he can't tell anyone about it. He's a Christian superstar. So he asks God to forgive him and moves on. Then he does it again and again and again, and each time it gets a little easier. Eventually, it becomes normal. It becomes part of the routine. But if we know anything about sin, it's that sin is rarely satisfied with the status quo. So eventually, you go a little further. You cross another line. That's the line you keep crossing for the next two or three years until that becomes normal. Then you cross another line, and you keep crossing that line for a while until that becomes normal. If this goes on for decades, you can end up as a Christian who's doing some seriously bad stuff behind the scenes. And keep in mind, now you really can't tell anyone about what you've been doing because you've been doing it for so long, it's no longer a moral slip. If people find out what you've been doing, they'll conclude that you're a fraud. And what would that do to your ministry? Think about the ministry. What happens next? Justification. Your mind can justify just about any behavior if you keep it up long enough. My work is so important and so stressful that God will understand that I need to have some affairs on the side. I'm using this example because both Ravi Zacharias and Martin Luther King used this as a justification. Ravi Zacharias would tell the ladies at the spas that he needed them to give him more than just a massage because he could only deal with the stress of his ministry through sexual release. Martin Luther King called extramarital sex a form of anxiety reduction. 
So yes, we're doing something wrong, but it's for the greater good. The difference between Ravi and MLK here is that Martin seems to have been genuinely remorseful over his affairs, while we have no evidence of Ravi acknowledging that there was a problem. He continued his affairs with other women even after he was called out for the sexting scandal, and his claim that he was a victim of extortion continued until his death. The other difference is that Martin's affairs were with willing participants, while Ravi's illicit acts were at least sometimes with young women who were manipulated and pressured and coerced. And that's why I regard Martin Luther King as a flawed hero, but I now regard Ravi as something worse. So Ravi justified his affairs. And if you do this day after day, year after year, you can get to the point where even if you're exposed by one of your victims, you can throw her and her husband under the bus, paint them as the abusers and yourself as the victim, and think that what you're doing is for the greater good of the church. Yes, it's sad that I have to lie and hurt this family's reputation, but if I told the truth, it would affect the faith of millions of Christians. It would destroy my ministry, a ministry that will continue doing God's work for years to come, even after my death. Why hurt my family and friends and millions of fans when I can just hurt these two people instead? And you end up sacrificing people on the altar of your ministry because your ministry is too important to lose. That's how you become a monster while still thinking that you're doing it for the glory of God. So how do we avoid this? How do we stop creating two-faced heroes? One. We need to recognize that there is a lot of temptation out there and that not many people are capable of dealing with it without stumbling, no matter how much you like their books and lectures. So very early on, before leaders get in the habit of covering up their sins, there should be preemptive interventions. Everyone in a ministry needs to sit down and say, we all understand that we're not perfect here. We all understand that we're capable of doing horrible things. Whatever else happens, we can't allow ourselves to get in the habit of justifying sin and hiding it from each other to protect this ministry. So here are the steps we're going to take to try to avoid falling into sin. And if one of us falls into sin, here's what he needs to do instead of covering it up. We know that we're going to face temptation. So, beloved leader, if you're traveling and you're stressed, and you find yourself in a bad place, here's the number you need to call to talk to someone you trust. If you do something bad, here's the person you need to call to confess what you've done and figure out what steps need to be taken. Now, let's all make a pact before the Almighty that we're going to stick with this plan. It should seem obvious that ministries need to do something like this, but what tends to happen is that people join the ministry of their hero and they've got him so high up on his pedestal, it never occurs to them that he might have problems. So they don't see a need for accountability. Two, Christians, stop with the leader worship. Your leaders may be gifted in certain areas. They may be gifted speakers or writers. They may have a knack for persuasion or for building global ministries. But if you think that because they're gifted in those areas, they must be gifted in virtue, that's a mistake. They could be gifted in virtue, but you can't conclude that from their great lectures. I'm pointing this out because there are people today who refuse to believe that Ravi Zacharias could have done anything that he's been accused of doing. Look, it's one thing to give someone the benefit of the doubt. It's one thing to say, well, from what I know about Ravi, he seems to be an awesome Christian leader. So when some woman that I don't know accuses him of something, I'm not going to believe her without good evidence. That's a reasonable position. But that's very different from everyone is lying. Ravi Zacharias is a saint. All of the women from completely different spas who gave remarkably similar stories about what Ravi did, it must be a conspiracy. Those women are obviously hackers, too, who put those photos on his phone and falsified his records about payments to his victims. You shouldn't be putting that much confidence in mere human beings. Three, Christian leaders. My goodness, get over yourselves. You're not that important. 
I could kind of put myself in this category because I have a lot of people who watch me. So I'll say, we need to get over ourselves. We're not that important. Our ministries are not that important. I know some people who are watching are thinking, no, of course this or that ministry is important. People are getting saved. Yeah, I didn't say they're not important. I said they're not that important. They're not so important that you should sacrifice your integrity, lie, and ruin people's lives for the sake of your ministry. Take any ministry on the planet, God can raise up a better one tomorrow. Take your favorite Christian leader in the world, God can raise up a better leader tomorrow. So why in the name of common sense do we think that we're so essential to Christianity that we can't let people know how screwed up we are? How have we convinced ourselves that our image is so important to our ministries that it's better to live a double life than to let people see what we actually struggle with? Christian leaders of the world, do you want to see how easy it is to tell people how screwed up you are? Do you want to see me show you how easy it is to announce to the world that you're a total misfit? I could spend the next three days telling you how screwed up I am. But let me give you a few examples from some different areas of life. We'll start with the obvious. Do you have any idea what it's like never feeling bad about anything you've ever done, even though you've done really, really horrible things? In case you're new here, I'm a diagnosed psychopath. We're characterized by lack of empathy and lack of remorse. Whatever bad feeling you have when you do something terrible, I've never felt it. I can recognize when I've done something I wasn't supposed to do. I can change my behavior. I try to act normal, which is why I said earlier that I've been living a double life since I was five years old. But I don't always do a good job. So, take marriage. My first year of marriage was the worst. The second year was no picnic either. My wife and I fought a lot, usually about really stupid stuff. We would end up yelling she would end up sobbing. One day she sent me an email and said, can you try to imagine what it's like for me pouring my heart out with tears streaming down my face and all I see staring back at me are these cold, dead eyes that don't seem to care about anything I'm saying? That was weird because I thought I was doing a good job just by standing there. Historically, when someone would start crying, I would be so disgusted by what I regarded as weakness and wasted fluid running out of their eyes that I just wanted to tell them to quit blubbering and then walk away. So I thought I was doing a good job by standing there while my wife cried. I thought I was doing a good job even though I was being a total jerk who didn't care about anything she was crying about. That was how good Christian David Wood acted early in our marriage. For the record, I do learn, and I now have better reactions, and we don't really fight anymore anyway. Parenting. Good Christian David Wood must be an awesome parent, right? I have to say, I've done a lot better than a lot of the other parents in my family tree, but I'm still screwed up. For example, I rarely played with my oldest sons, Luke and Blaze, when they were little, because I always felt like it was a waste of my time. I would take them to the playground, but I would bring a book or a laptop with me. They would try to get me to chase them, and I would tell them I had too much work to do. So if you go back to when I was working on my PhD and going around speaking and debating and blogging and making videos, I was only able to do all that because I was willing to ignore my kids. Not all the time, but too much of the time. What about family and friends dying? When someone dies, no matter who it is, I only have two thoughts. One, how does this affect whatever I'm doing right now? And two, oh crap, now people are going to call me and try to comfort me, and I have to sit there like an idiot and listen to them. My dad died back in, I think it was 2008. His friend Billy found him dead with his head in a garbage can. Marie woke me up and handed me the phone, and Billy told me that my dad died. I thought to myself, why did you have to wake me up for this when you could have called later in the day? Then I thought, oh crap, now people are going to call me and try to comfort me because they're stupid. When Nabil died, 
I was just about to post something on Twitter. He died, and I thought to myself, wow, no one knows Nabil died except me, his family, and Mike Lacona. I guess I'm going to get a lot of retweets on this one. So I announced that Nabil had died. Then I thought, oh crap, now people are going to try to comfort me because they're stupid enough to think that they need to comfort me. My mom died of a drug overdose. My brother called me. I was at Vocab's house in Phoenix. I was planning to make a video that day. When my brother told me that our mom died, I thought to myself, well, making a video about my mom dying will actually be easier than the other video I was planning to make. So my day just got easier. I hope people are learning that they don't need to call me to try to comfort me. What about friends? Ask my friends what happens if they really annoy me. I'll shun them for like two years. And it's not that I'm consciously shunning them. My mind will wipe them out of existence so that I don't even think about them for a year or two. If they try texting me or calling me, I somehow think of them almost like it's a stranger trying to contact me or a wrong number. I'll just ignore it. Then eventually my brain unshuns them and I haven't thought about them in so long, I don't even remember what they did to tick me off. Let's go in a different direction. When I was growing up, I had some delusional thoughts. I would think periodically that animals controlled the world or that I was part of an experiment. When I became a Christian in jail, that went away for a while. Years later, I noticed that if I went a couple of weeks without praying or reading the Bible, or if I ended up in some long-term, ongoing, stressful situations, the delusional thoughts would come back. I would start thinking that people were conspiring against me. Fast forward to 2007 and 2008, Reed, our third son, was born. He has a genetic muscle disease. He was in the hospital for months, about half an hour away from our apartment. I was still in graduate school, and we had to pay the bills, and we already had two young children, and we wanted at least one of us to be with Reed as much as possible, and keeping up this endless mad rush day after day, I started to realize that I was about to start having delusional thoughts again. But I couldn't. There was too much at stake. There was no time for delusions of conspiracies. So, by what seemed like sheer force of will, I made myself not go crazy. I forced myself to not lose my mind. The delusional thoughts never came back after that, no matter what happened. But as soon as that problem went away, I started getting an urge to blow my brains out. Not from depression. I don't get miserable and suicidal. We were totally focused on helping our kids. There was just this weird urge to kill myself in a certain way. Not anyway. I felt like I needed to put a gun to the front of my head with my thumb on the trigger and blow my brains out. No other way, just that particular way. It seemed like it would feel good. And this came out of nowhere. As soon as I stopped having delusional thoughts, it was like my mind had always had a leak in it. And as soon as I plugged the leak, it sprang a leak in a completely different area. Now, I wasn't going to do it, but I had this urge to do it all day long. I've heard from people who've quit smoking that even after the nicotine is completely out of their system, they sometimes have an urge to grab a cigarette, like they need to have a cigarette in their hands. It was like that, only it was a gun at the front of my head blowing out my brains. Why am I telling you this when no one needs to know this? I'm trying to show you that some people are screwed up and that you'd never know about it unless they told you. Here's another urge. I feel really weird when people praise me and tell me how great I am. It feels wrong. But it feels right when people are attacking me and insulting me. I've been on the bottom of a pile of dudes who were stomping me into the ground on the side of the road and somehow it was the most comfortable feeling in the world at that time. To this day, when people are telling me how awesome I am, I get an urge to do something outrageous, something that will tick them off, something that will make them not like me. And sometimes I do it. If you see me doing something that ticks a lot of people off, chances are someone was showering me with praise and I acted out in response. What is that? Doesn't make any sense. I'm just screwed up. 
And just to give you something that more of you can relate to, yes, I have had periodic problems with pornography. I grew up on porn. I got caught with a penthouse magazine when I was six years old. I was kissing the pictures. I started watching porn flicks in fourth grade. When I became a Christian, I wouldn't look at that stuff anymore. But going back to the issue of willpower, when I was at the end of a semester in graduate school, and I had five papers due, and I would go multiple days with no sleep, suddenly watching porn would seem like the thing to do. And then, once you start watching it again, it starts to become normal again, and you keep watching it for the next three weeks, even after your papers are all done. So what do you do? You take some steps to make yourself stop. And if the steps aren't working, then you raise the stakes, get more people involved. And if you have to, you smash your computer into a thousand pieces. What you don't do is let it become normal and justify it and spend the rest of your life pretending that you don't have a problem. So those are a few examples. I could give plenty more. Why am I sharing any of this? Well, people from all around the world watch my videos. People love David Wood. And yet, I was a screwed up son. I'm a screwed up husband, a screwed up father, a screwed up friend, and a screwed up Christian. I'm all around screwed up. Nothing that I've shared here from my personal life needed to be public knowledge. The point is, you Christian leaders who cover up how screwed up you are, what are you scared of? Are you scared that people will learn that you're not God's gift of perfection? You're not. Jesus was. Now, to be clear, there are ways I'm not screwed up. I have positive qualities. There are ways I'm abnormally awesome, but they're not really relevant for this video, except perhaps the fact that I don't care a whole lot what people think about me. The point is, I'm a mixed bag, and so are you. And so are all of your favorite Christian speakers in the world. So why in the name of common sense are we trying to cover it up? Christians should be letting other Christians know what our faults and weaknesses are so that we can help each other out. We shouldn't be hiding our faults and weaknesses so that we can pretend we're better than we really are. And if you're still worried about what people might say, if they learn about your problems, just think. What's your reaction to everything I just said about myself? Yes, there will be some people who say, Oh my goodness, David, it's so horrible. Yes, there will be keyboard jihadis who take clips from this and make videos titled, David Wood Exposed, David Wood Admits, blah, blah, blah. Do I know that some people will use the information in this video to attack me? Absolutely. Fine with that. Do I like being attacked? I sure do. Do I regularly feed people who hate me information on how to attack me because I know that it will give me a burst of energy that I will then use to go after their ideology? Uh-huh. But notice, most people who watch what I just said, and probably you, are thinking, wow, it's cool that he just admitted all that. Most people will never hold anything I just said against me because people tend to be very forgiving when other people admit their problems. So again, what is everyone scared of? Maybe it's, well, if I admitted that I've got all these problems after being a Christian for so long, people might think that Jesus isn't really working in my life. But think about how stupid that is. What would happen to Christians if their problems went away? when they became Christians. What would happen if you became a Christian and you no longer had to deal with anger and lust and selfishness and you stood on your pedestal of perfection and looked around at everyone else in the world and their endless problems? Well, you'd probably end up with a bigger problem. It's called pride. I say it's a bigger problem because it's the hardest to see in yourself when all you can see is how much better you are than everyone else. The Almighty lets us wrestle against our faults to keep us from pride, but then, because of our pride, we conceal our faults. What are we, morons? 
For some reason, we have trouble seeing the big picture. Let me give you an example here. Nabil was diagnosed with stomach cancer a few years ago. People around the world were praying for Nabil to be healed. I was praying for Nabil to be healed. But even though I was praying for Nabil to be healed, I was also thinking about a potential problem. Those of us who knew Nabil knew that the biggest issue he had to struggle with was pride. It would usually come out if you were arguing with him. Sometimes he ended up talking down to people. And this is a pretty natural issue to struggle with when you're generally the smartest person in any room and you're always the best speaker in every room and you haven't done a lot of horrible things in life and you become a Christian and you're instantly thrust onto the world stage and you're picked up by the biggest apologetics ministry on the planet and you've got credentials from universities around the world. Nabil wrote three books. He was working on two more. He had just completed his master's degree at Oxford and he was starting to work on his doctorate at Oxford. That would have been his second doctorate. He already had an MD. Then he got his cancer diagnosis, stage four stomach cancer. And we were all praying for God to heal him. Come on, Lord, Nabil is too important for us to lose. We're looking forward to all of the things he's going to accomplish in the future. How amazing would a miraculous healing be? But think about this. Out of all the suffering people in the world, wouldn't a miraculous healing of Nabil be like God saying, you're right, this guy is too important to let go. Wouldn't it be like God putting his stamp of approval on Nabil? This is my beloved apologist in whom I am well pleased. What do you think that might have done to someone whose main struggle was with pride? Combine a miraculous stamp of approval from God with multiple doctorates, multiple bestsellers, and millions of adoring fans, that might have created a monster disguised as God's gift to apologetics. A miraculous healing could have done far more damage to Nabil spiritually than cancer ever did to him physically. So don't expect God to always get you out of your problems. Expect God to get you through your problems. And remember that some of your problems might be God's way of keeping you from worse problems. But whatever you do, if you have a problem that other people could help you with, don't act like you don't have a problem because your problem will just get worse and that will lead to bigger problems. As for Ravi, the new patron saint of letting a problem turn into bigger problems, think about how differently he would be remembered right now if he had been honest at any point about his sin. If he'd been honest early on in his career, he could have avoided hurting a lot of people. Even if he'd been honest at the end, I think we'd be remembering him very differently right now. Imagine if Ravi's last book had been a massive confession of all the things he had done over the years and how he had fallen into sin and how he had justified it and how we can keep this from happening in the future. If he had done something like that, even if he had put it all into a letter to be read after his death, I think he would have been remembered as a flawed hero. Instead, he chose to lie and to proclaim his innocence of everything except for some minor slips and to throw his victims under the bus, all to protect his ministry and his legacy. How's that working out for him?